been here several times, and we always look forward to it. And if you haven't heard him, you're going to be blessed. He'll bring us God's message. We'll listen attentively and uh, let God direct your hearts this morning. He'll be back tonight, Lord willing, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. Don't miss a service. God has something for us. Dr. Bagwell, if you will come at this time, please. The book of Jeremiah, if you will turn to the first chapter of that great prophecy, Jeremiah chapter number one. It is in my heart, and I will pursue this plan unless God leads differently, and he may. Uh, we will be in Jeremiah in this book of Scripture again tonight. And likely tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings as well. And I realize that in every congregation, it is the nature of life today. Uh, many will, due to work or other reasons, not be able to return to each service. But I do want to invite those of you who can. You have that flexibility. Some of you would be here anyway. But with Jeremiah in mind, perhaps the most pertinent of all the Old Testament prophets in addressing the situations we face today, he'll be our focus, the Lord willing. I learned something this week I, I did not know. I would have never guessed this. Jeremiah, in volume, in the amount of the material he contains, get this, is the biggest book in Scripture. That astounds me. You ask me the longest book in the Bible, I'm going to say Psalms. My goodness, it has 150 chapters. and You're telling me Jeremiah is longer? in bytes, you know, like in megabytes and gigabytes, in bytes. Jeremiah is the largest book of Scripture. Now, obviously, I just said it is not the biggest book in, verse, in, in chapters. It is not the biggest book in verses. But in, and boy, what he says, the content is astounding. Before I read the text, maybe another thing or two about Jeremiah the preacher. He, he has what might be the longest ministry, longest ministry of any preacher in the Word of God. Our Savior's public ministry was what, three years, three and a half, a little over three years and we come up with that by counting the Passovers he attended. John the Baptist, less than that. There are some Old Testament prophets whose ministries last merely months. But Jeremiah undoubtedly preached 40 plus years Many of the commentators say 45 years. I even read one who says Jeremiah's ministry pushed 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a long time to preach to the same people, the citizens of Jerusalem, the people of the little land of Judah. And get this, Brother Roy, it is absolutely amazing not one time in those 45 years is it written in the Bible. Not one time did anybody get saved under Jeremiah's ministry. There is not a record of a single convert in all 52 chapters 
that Jeremiah has written for us. I'm going to need an amen here. That's called faithfulness. That's called faithfulness. And uh, maybe then this. Jeremiah, I've heard of him all my Christian life. Who is he? What does the name mean? Jeremiah. It's a blending of two Hebrew words. One's a noun and one's a verb. Jeremiah, listen to that, Yah, Jeremiah, that's God's name, Jehovah, Jeremiah, God's name, Jehovah, when shortened in the Old Testament is Yah, Yah, Jeremiah, whatever the name Jeremiah means, God's right in the middle of it, Jeremiah, the the J is a little bit tricky, the way we pronounce it in English. Uh, the Jera part of Jeremiah, the, the word is, it's in a verb, a Hebrew verb, room. Room, they spell it R-U-M, room. What does the verb room mean? It means I establish. I lift up. I set him in place. The name Jeremiah means it's not my idea. I'm not here preaching on my own charge. I'll need an amen. God Almighty established me. God has put me in position. Jeremiah the prophet. I don't even know if I'm beginning at the best place. Seems like chapter one is where you ought to start. And the Holy Spirit seemed to give me liberty to do that. If I'm going to spend a week in Jeremiah, I sure want to know about, I'll tell you, it just interests me. I want to know about his call to the ministry. Now, you don't have to amen this, but I'd appreciate it if two or three of you would. I'm not interested in hearing a preacher if he hadn't got a call. I'm not drawn to merely professional orators. That just doesn't interest me. But if the hand of God's on somebody, I'd like to hear them. Jeremiah's call. There is a whole, and you young preachers get this, there is a whole body of literature in Scripture called, quote, the call narratives. The call, C-A-L-L, -L, the call narratives of the Bible. What God did when he called his men into the ministry. We know how God called Isaiah. We know how God called Gideon. We know how God called Samuel. Mercy, he's just a little fella. Samuel, Samuel, call narratives of the Bible. We're going to read one of those call narratives of Scripture. They follow a pattern. Uh, let me say this, and there'll be the preachers and lay preachers and young preachers will say amen to it. I sure am glad God calls his men. I'll tell y'all something. And it's personal. I shouldn't even be relayed. I am as sure God called me to preach as I am, God saved my soul. The call when God put me into the ministry is as real, it is as palpable, it is as experiential as the day he birthed me into his family. I want to know about the call of this man, Jeremiah. Preacher, it's so neat. There is a pattern to these call narratives. The pattern goes like this, and it'll be here, and I'll read the verses, and we'll work our way through them rather quickly. Uh, first thing about the call narrative, help me with an amen, God shows up. God shows up. Jeremiah's idea wasn't to preach. I'll speak for myself. as the farthest thing from my mind. God shows up. It's his idea. The second thing about the call narratives, generally speaking, 
the one being called is scared half to death. There is usually a word of rebuttal. Uh, Gideon, the mighty man of valor, God's calling Gideon to be a judge. Well, Gideon looked like anything but a mighty man of valor. His little nation was at war. Enemy soldiers were everywhere. The day God called him, Gideon was threshing wheat, hidden, hidden in the lowest place he could be for fear of the enemy. And God says, thou mighty man of valor. Not me, Lord. Not me. There is usually... Moses! Moses, I need you. Well, Lord, I can't do that. Lord, I can't even talk. I can't even speak. There's usually some human resistance. I'll say this. Somebody smile or holler amen. God overcomes resistance. Aren't you glad for that? After that initial part of the dialogue, God will state the calling. God will give a man a job to do. Our job today as preachers is rather generic. I can put it in three words if you'll help me. Preach the word. Preach the word. You hold in your hand this morning the greatest book ever written. 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses of absolutely inspired, inerrant, that means without mistake, Scripture. Preach the word God gives to Jeremiah. His job, his duty, his calling. I can't wait for us to see the words. Then God says, and you're, you're responding so well, I just need another smile or two. God says, I've told you what to do. Now I'll go with you to help you do it. I will empower you for the job at hand. Paul didn't say, I can do all things myself. I can handle it. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's Jeremiah chapter 1. And I'd like to begin at verse 1, but time probably wouldn't be wise. We'll start at verse 4. And I'm going to read verse 4, starting at verse 4, down through and including verse 10. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. It's narrative. It's going to tell us a story. Then the word of the Lord came unto me. See, that's first person. Jeremiah's relating it. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, now this is astounding. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, here it comes, y'all watch. Then said I, ah, oh, Lord God, I, behold, I cannot speak. For I am a child, but the Lord... I'm thankful for those three words right there, but the Lord. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Watch this one. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then, here comes empowerment. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Don't you like it when whoever's preaching has God's words in his mouth? Not philosophy, not psychology, not current events. Tell me what God says about them. Verse 10, see, Jeremiah, I have this day set thee over the nations 
and over the kingdoms. Watch this. To root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Period. End of paragraph. End of text. End of Jeremiah's call, narrative, or experience. That's how God enlisted this great prophet to do his work. May I just say this, and we'll start right here. I'm glad that same God is still on the throne. Tell you what I believe, don't know if you'll go here with me or not, I think God still calls preachers. I think God still puts his hand on young men, choice young men, his young men, and will use them till till, till the rapture uh, to preach his glorious word in these last days. Where would we be apart from the word of God proclaimed? Well, verse number four, oh, I love this. The word of the Lord that came unto me saying, the word of the Lord came into me say, Preacher, Brother Roy, last night, well, it was early this morning, I just used my laptop. How many times in Jeremiah did the word of the Lord come into him? I think it's more than any other prophet, though I could be wrong. I only checked Jeremiah 43 times in 52 chapters the word of the Lord showed up in his life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the dominating theme of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was not born with the view of becoming a preacher. If I had read the first three verses, and you'll be glad I didn't before it's over. He's born in the city of Anathoth suburban Jerusalem, two miles outside the capital city. His daddy is a priest, a priest, not a prophet, a priest. You know what that means? That means Jeremiah will be a priest also. The priesthood is passed from father to son, but God just interrupts the program. God says this one will not be a priest. This one will be a preacher. This one will be a prophet of Almighty God. And the defining theme of Jeremiah's man, he's a quiet, Jeremiah is often called, you know this, the weeping prophet. He does not have a strong personality. I'll just go ahead and tell you this. The man Jeremiah, He gets discouraged rather easily. I I don't even want to say this, but it's true. The book, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you. Uh, He gets his feelings hurt pretty easily. He cries a lot. He he is a soft-hearted individual. I don't think he would have made it 45 years the opposition he's going to face if, get me an amen ready, the word of the Lord hadn't kept coming to him. The word of the Lord came into me. I love this, the word of the Lord. The, the noun for word, listen to it, it's debar. I'll spell the noun. D-A-B-A-R, debar. It literally has this book. The, how many of y'all believe that right there is the word of God? Dabar, the the, the noun dabar, it doesn't mean the leather. It doesn't mean the paper, nor does it mean India ink. It means this, the message, the fact, the truth embodied within the covers of that book right there. I'm glad God's word is truth. The word of the Lord came unto me. I guess, Brother Gary, this is called personification. In fact, there's some poetry in this call narrative. What does personification mean? That book to Jeremiah came alive. The word of the Lord came unto me. The little verb there for came 
Hebrew, Hava, H-A-V-A-H. It literally means it popped up. It came into existence. It appeared in my life. And once the word of God grips you, grasps you, gets a hold of you, I'll need an amen. You'll never get away from that. The word of the Lord came unto me. Hey, tell you what, we'll have revival if the word of God gets cut loose around here this week. We'll have revival if the word of God comes unto us. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, and I'm way behind time already on this message, but that little word saying, uh, it, 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 it changes from dabar to the Hebrew verb amar amar. And it means this, this is a, it means saying, and it involves the communication. It involves the tone of voice. It involves the inflection of enunciation. Listen, that book right there, the word of God help me, it can talk to you. Amen. It can talk to you. How many of you early ones, Monday morning, Friday morning, you was about sun up, you was fixing to go to work, you had out your little testament, you was reading the word of God, and all of a sudden somebody holler, amen, it came alive to you. It's like God showed up in the room. It's like the sun got brighter, the grass got greener, and God began to reveal himself. The word of the Lord came into me saying, Sometimes it talks to me sternly. Sometimes it speaks to me sweetly. Sometimes it just gathers me up and hugs and encourages me. Sometimes it wears me out for something I've done wrong. Aren't you glad I say again, it's a living book. The word of the Lord came into me saying, if these five meetings are nothing but lectures, you will have no revival. If these five meetings are nothing but intellectual property being acquired, I'll experience no revival. But if that thing gets blessed and breathed by the Holy Ghost, if it has, like Paul prayed, free course, and it's glorified. If it runs all over this great big room, I'm telling you, revival will happen in Fletcher. Word of the Lord came into me saying, verse two, verse two, and please don't count how many verses I read. I'm only in verse two. I'm sorry, verse five, the second verse of my text. Let me get it right, verse five. But I really scared you then. I thought, Lord, he's going backwards. We'll be here at uh, three o'clock. Verse five. God's talking. Oh, can I say this? Jeremiah's call is expressed here as a, get this word, dialogue. What's a dialogue? That's when two people are talking to each other. God showed up and said something to Jeremiah. Jeremiah talked back to God. God's got something else to say to Jeremiah. Jeremiah responds. I don't know, maybe I'm way out on a limb. I think God can still talk to folks today. I don't mean necessarily in an audible voice. I mean through his word, and I know he lets us speak back to him. That's the great privilege of prayer. Again, verse five. Before I, oh, I don't know what to do with this verse. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and then I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Talk about a biography. <laughs> I just learned something happened to Jeremiah before he was thought of. Then I learned something about him when he was in utero, in his mother's body. Then I learned something about him after he's born, saved, grown, preaching the word of God. Just for a minute or two, we ought to play with this. We ought to look at it. Uh, uh, wh what does it say, verse five? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. I knew you. The verb is yada, Y-A-D-A. -A. I knew all about you. I knew it. I think before Dan Bagwell, my daddy, 
and Sarah Bagwell, my mama, ever got married, I think God probably knew I was a coming along someday. Are y'all okay with that? You say you think God knows all that? Let me go on record. Pretty sure he knows everything. Yeah, but you're talking like he knows the end from the beginning. Let me go on. If I'm just talking like it, let me apologize. I want to declare it. He does know the end from the beginning. He's omniscient, we say, knows it all. Before you were even in the womb, I knew you. I, that's a hot potato theologically. I, I don't know how to handle it. I don't know what to do with it, but I'm going to believe it because it's right there in the word of all my... I tell you what, I think God already knows who the Antichrist is. I need some amen. I think God already knows the day the rapture is going to take place. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised God already knows the day you're going to heaven. He probably knows how you're going to heaven, whether it's the rapture or the grave. Oh, the massive knowledge of an almighty. What was it the, uh, the, the, the scriptures say? Who if ever taught him anything? I can answer that. Nobody's ever taught him anything because he had all wisdom to begin with. But then when you were in the womb, I sanctified you. Did I get my verb right? I think I did, but I do want to check. I don't want to preach it wrongly. Oh, yeah. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you. I sure don't know what kind of doctrine I'm creating up here this morning. I'm just preaching the word of God, word. Sanctified you. What does that mean? Not sure all it means, but it happened before he was born. I sanctified you. The word is kodesh, or it's a Hebrew. It's related to kodesh. It's kadesh, but it's the same word. What does it mean? To make holy. To make holy. That's not going to work as good. Sanctified, our English, our King James word here, it means God picked him up from here, one status, and set him down over here in a different place spiritually. This verse teaches God can do something for a little embryo, a little baby boy, or a little baby girl. I don't know if I'll get a single amen. I'm getting some weird looks before they even get here. Now, I'm not saying God can save an unborn soul. That's not what the scripture declares. I am not saying, no, no, no. But God knew he was going to use this young preacher boy and God's already put a hand of protection on him, help me, before he's ever born. A God that can do that can do anything. But wait a minute. Before in the womb and afterward, God said, I've got something to do with that word prophet. I've, I've ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, this is tricky. And I double-checked it a minute ago. The word ordained there, I'll spell it. It's a, it's a Hebrew verb, natan. It's spelled N-A-T-H-A-N, natan. What does it mean? It is the classic. Seldom does it mean anything else. It is the classic Hebrew verb. I gave you. I gave you. It is literally saying, God's saying, now, before you was ever thought of, I knew you. In the womb, I have put my hand on you, have sanctified you. But now, as a preaching prophet, you are my, hope I get an amen, you are my gift to the nations. Amen. Well, that was a pitiful amen. I got two right through here. God said, I've called you, I've strengthened you, I've empowered you, and you are my gift to the people of this world. Amen. Sitting over there, I couldn't see Brother Roy real well, but I could lean over a little bit and see him sitting in the, in the chair up there. And I thought, my, 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 no need an amen here. What a blessedness man of God is to these people. 
You could search far and wide. You would not find a man of God any more loving in heart, any more diligent in being a shepherd to a flock of people. What a blessing I'm doing. I'm doing what God did about Jeremiah. He is God's gift to Fletcher, North Carolina. I have ordained you. I've given you as a gift to the people of God. That's Jeremiah. Now, before the week's out, you're probably not going to like him a lot. He becomes a spirit-filled, plain-spoken, feisty little declarer of the Word of God. But I will say this, he tells the truth, and if we got a need for anything in America, we need a generation of leaders who'll tell the truth again. That we need. We better, we better glance at the next verse and I'll not continue endlessly here. Uh, verse 6, and we'll do this. Then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm just a child. Lord, I can't handle it. That's beyond me. I, I would be unable to do it. The ministry, preaching, especially that to which Jeremiah signed, no Human being is qualified or capable as far as an individualistic sense is concerned. Lord, I can't do it. He never said anything any more true in all of his life. God didn't tell us we had to do it. I'll need an amen. He said, get out of the way and I'll do it through you. I'm a child. That word in our King James Bible, it's translated five different ways. Anything from an infant, I'm pretty sure Jeremiah wasn't preaching when he was an infant, to a young man. Usually late teens, one authority, and he's a brilliant man, said probably about age 20. Jeremiah heard this call, 18, 19, 20, to preach the word of God. I'm going to need a little help here. Sure, I'm glad God can use young people. I thank God for every senior saint that's serving him. I thank God for every granddaddy and grandmama and mama and daddy, but I'm glad he's got some young people. He's set on fire to do his work. Jeremiah's one of them. God's going to use him as a young preacher. Verse 7. God said, don't say you're a child. You'll go, to ever, you'll go to all that I'll send thee. Whatsoever I'll command thee, thou shalt speak. Boy, you talk about some reinforcement. Son, you're going everywhere I send you. And you're going to say everything I say. And when that kind of a, this is the God who created the universe. This is the God who spoke the stars into existence. If that God says you're going to go do it, I reckon you are going to go do it. Who's going to talk back to him? Old Dr. Lee Robertson used to say, and I love to say, where God guides, he provides. Where God guides, he provides. Let's begin to finish up the little account that Jeremiah has. Oh, 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 verse 8, I, I just have to comment. Jeremiah got something else to say. Be not afraid of their faces, for I'm with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Jeremiah was assigned some things to say that upset people. I don't want to give away any other text or any of the sermons, but the boy spent a good deal of time in jail. Not for stealing, not for killing, not for any kind of a moral charge. He spent time in jail for preaching the truth of the Word of God. I'm glad we got liberty in America such as we do, but not one of us can guarantee we might someday have some problems preaching the truth. There's some of the truth you preach now, you're liable to get in a little bit of trouble, say amen. Don't be afraid of their faces. I don't have that problem today. 
I see smiling faces for the most part. Well, two of you are sound asleep, but other than that, I see smiling faces for the most part. Kindness, nodding of a head, an amen, lip sink to, to me, or, or loud when I ask for one. You've been so kind. But Jeremiah did not always have that privilege. They were angry at him. They'd gnash on him with teeth. They'd lie about him. They would curse him. They would threaten him. One time, I was listening to this. I have a little thing called a Kindle, and it's reading me a commentary on Jeremiah driving over yesterday. And it, it gave the illustration, and it comes up. I doubt I'll get to preach it. They tried him one day, found him guilty of treason, sentenced him to be executed. He's on death row. Of course, God intervenes, takes care of all that as man gets to live and preach. And, uh, don't be afraid of their faces. They're going to look at you real mean. Boy, it'd take a psychoanalyst to help you there. What do you do? You're already fearful in body, you know, in temperament. What do you do? Here's God's solution to fear. I will be with you. I will be with you. I don't even have to fear the valley of the shadow of death. You know why? He will be with me. Hallelujah. I'll be with you, Jeremiah. Well, verse number nine. I love this. Preacher, I went out to the car to get my little stopwatch. It's not in the car. I may own two or three tonight, I don't know, but uh, it's not in the car. Uh, I don't know where the little thing is. I try to keep up with my time, but I am hurrying. Verse number nine. Then the Lord, Jeremiah, then the Lord put forth his hand. Therefore put forth, it's the same verb where God says, you're going to go where I send you, son. But I'll never send you, but I'll send my hand of power to be with you. The Lord put forth his hand. Watch, tell me that next verb. The Lord put forth his hand and did what? Oh, I want all of you to say it. He did what? He touched. He touched my mouth. And the Lord said, I have put my words into your mouth. Jeremiah, you're timid, you're fearful. I can sense hesitancy. Would you just let me touch your mouth? Now you don't have to worry again about your vocabulary. You don't even have to go take public speech 101. God's words are in your mouth. I'm a country boy. Open up and let them fly. Preach God's word. Debbie asked me a minute ago, we were sitting over there, and she said, uh, how are you feeling? I must have been fidgety. This is a bigger place than we usually go, and more people than we usually have the honor, and it is an honor to address considering the Word of God. I looked back at her, and I said, honey, I'm all right. Talking about preaching, I said, it wasn't my idea in the first place. Buddy, if my personality is in charge, we're going to the house. But God called me and God equipped me and all I got to do today is move myself aside and let God's word flow forth. And I'll tell you what I believe. I believe God's word will help God's people. What do y'all think? I'll put my words in your mouth. Nothing like the touch of God. I'll put my words, put in. Let me be sure. I, I want to see. I want to see the way our King James words it. Oh yes, the Lord said, "I have put my words in thy mouth." Now I can't explain this. I wasn't there in sixteen eleven with the years prior when they tra have put. Is that little word we had a minute ago, natan, translate it to give. God literally says, Jeremiah, don't worry. 
I have given you my words. I have given you my words. You are now possessed by my words. They have just moved in, taken over, and they will be the guiding force of your life. Amen. Here's how that would work. If you're a member of Fletcher First Baptist, you would go to Sunday school. You would sit dutifully and respectfully as the class took care of the preliminaries, the announcements, the prayer requests, however y'all may do it in your uh, individual class. But you'd be saying, when's he going to teach? When's she going to get that book? When's she going to open up some verses? When's he going to share with me the word of God? You would be, you would be consumed. You'd be overcome. Get me two amens. With the word of Almighty God. The good choir would sing, and that was good singing. And the good specials would be heard at 1045. And those were the wonderful specials. My, what a thrill to our son. But you'd be eager for the man of God to mount the pulpit, announce the text, give you the scripture, because you are possessed. It's a given. You are hungry for the word of God. That's what got Jeremiah through. That's what brought hope to the people of Judah in the darkest time they ever had uh, faced, at least up to that point. I, I gotta, God's still giving his word. God's still making folks hungry for it. God's still got it as an obsession if you're interested in it. I'm, give me an amen if it's just a courtesy amen. Anybody interested in the word of God today? That's why a preacher has revivals. That's why we meet Sunday morning, Sunday night. That's why we try to be... Last verse, verse 10. I've set thee over the nations and kingdoms. I, I'll just comment on this. To root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down. What in the world is this all about? Four negative verbs. It almost sounds like he sounds like he said, go out there and tear some things up, Jeremiah. Yeah. There's some things that really need to be rooted up. There's some things that need to be demolished. You go out there and do it, I'll appreciate it. Now, I don't know how to say this, but here's a feeble attempt. There's some things in America that need to be dismantled today. Yeah. There's some things going on wholesale and they're not right. God's not pleased. And if we keep it up, we're gonna reap the judgment of the Almighty one of these days. And don't you admire it when a man of God has the courage, has the stamina to stand in that pulpit and say what we're doing is wrong. The national current is leading us in the wrong direction. Let's stand up and be counted as believers in the Lord Jesus. Jeremiah, there's some things you're going to have to attack. Four negatives, but please notice this. Then come two positives. I didn't read them. They're at the end of verse 10. Then build and plant. You can't really start your garden and put out your corn and your beans till you've broken up the hard ground till you've thrown the rocks and the wheat. You've got to kill the wheat. There's a lot of negative work got to be done before you can put the seed in the ground. Amen. Then you'll build. Then you'll plant to the glory of God. There he is. His name is Jeremiah. We've met him. 18, 19, 20. He's just starting out. He don't know it, but it's going to be a long ministry. Never a convert. Many a season in jail, hated and despised. He'll cry, he'll cry buckets full of tears for the wayward people. But oh, what a man of God he was. I'm closing. Jesus said, just out of curiosity to his disciples, who are they saying that I am? Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Oh, they had heard some things. 
but one of them said, a uh, bunch of them think you're Jeremiah the prophet who's come back. Why? Jeremiah was godly. Jesus was godly. Jeremiah wept with a broken heart over sin. Jesus wept with a broken heart over sin. Jeremiah was sentenced to be executed. Jesus was, Jeremiah was spared. Jesus was not. Jeremiah was so much like Jesus. People identified him with the Lord when the Savior came to earth. This and I'm through. Thank God, thank God for that book, 52 chapters. Thank God for that preacher. But don't forget, you got a man of God, you got a book, you can be as hungry as they were. Three words, a good amen, and I'll sit down. Let's have revival. Let's have revival this week and let God speak to our hungry hearts. Would you stand with us, bowing your heads? Closing your eyes, our musicians will come and song leader. If anybody knows how to prepare a congregation for revival, Brother Roy Waldrop does. I have no doubt of that. But if our musicians could softly play what our song leader has chosen, nobody staring, nobody looking, I wonder if might be somebody want to use the altar for a moment. Well, preacher, what would I do? Here's what you'd do. Lord, revive my heart. Revive my soul in this special little time of revival meeting. I wonder if somebody, and as soon as they touch the keyboard, the invitation has begun. You may come, or you may come now. I wonder if somebody would say, Lord, make me the gift of your word. Make me excited. Thrill me. Help it to take over, to be a passion. And God, give me some tears for my nation as Jeremiah did for his. Help me to stand against the wrong and promote that which is right. Somebody get in this altar this morning and pray for somebody you love. Somebody that's out of church. Somebody that's drifting further and further away. Ask God to speak to them. Ask God to touch them. Ask God to turn them. He knew them before they were born. Jesus died to save them. God's a God that can put homes back together and reunite families. God's a God who welcomed the prodigal back home, isn't he? Jesus is the Savior who was interested in the blind and the lame. In a woman with five husbands and she's living with somebody else beside all of them. He had compassion for somebody taken in the act of adultery. You don't have a loved one past his reach. God, revive our hearts. Whisper to us, speak to us. May the words of Jeremiah, uh, that could be better said, may the words of God through the lips of Jeremiah stir our hearts. We'll thank thee. And if you're here today unsaved, never been born again, never experienced his marvelous grace, if you'll come, this pastor will direct you. Somebody will pray with you. God can birth you into his family. Just as I am, let's sing that first verse. We don't even need the number. Sing it, please. Anybody else need to come?
Thank God for his word for Dr. Bagwell. Usher's going to come at this time. We're going to receive a love offering for him. Give obediently, mind the Lord. Brother Bagwell goes anywhere that people ask him to go. God has uh, blessed us with a church that's able to give. And the offering should be more than enough to supply his needs, but then think that God sends him to smaller churches, that no doubt he goes home with uh, offerings that can't sustain him during the week. So God uses larger churches to sustain him in those other weeks. So as we're given to him, we're providing God's word to go out to various places, full-time evangelist. So let's give unto the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. For men like Jeremiah, you gave us an example. You gave the example through him that it's an evil time in which he preached. We live in an evil time. Help us, Father, to preach your word, to stand boldly. Lord, we know we're going to give an account for every word, for every action, for every deed. Help us, Lord, in this time to make a difference. You trusted us, Father. You let us live in this time in America so we could live a life pleasing before you and let your word go out. It will accomplish that which you meant it to accomplish. We thank you for Brother Bagwell, for everyone that can give and will give. Lord, help us to come back tonight prepared to receive your word prepared in their heart to have revival so we can be revived and teach men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of God, the love of God, and show forth in this generation that you still live and you still save. We love you, Father. Thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 